Christine Minas. I am the moderator for today's session. Very exciting topic, risk management, uh, the obscure hero of strategic planning. I think it'll be a very interesting discussion. Avant de commencer, j'aimerais vous rappeler que si c'est possible de uh, mettre votre uh, mic uh, micro en uh, silence, uh, parce que c'est mieux pour la présentation. So before we start, if you could please put your microphones on mute, that would be uh, best for the presentation. Also, if you have questions, please insert them in the Q's and A's uh, uh, P, um, sorry, feature that we have on Zoom. Uh, if the chat function will be separate, but if you have questions, please put them in this uh, in the section on Q Q's and A's. Uh, S'il vous plaît, votre, um, mettre vos questions dans la section de questions et réponses uh, dans le, le, le logiciel Zoom au lieu de uh, utiliser la fonction de chat. Okay. Donc, uh, c'est un grand plaisir d'être ici uh, parmi vous aujourd'hui. Uh, J'ai le, le plaisir d'introduire notre premier um, animateur, uh, Taran Wassin. Uh, he is currently with Shared Services Canada and is also our representative from IPAC, the Institute for uh, Public Administration of Canada. And he has some opening remarks that he'd like to share with you. Taran, vous avez la parole. Merci, Christine. Thank you, Christine. Um, so welcome, bienvenue tout le monde. Um, I want to begin by um, with a, a land acknowledgement. So here in the National Capital Region, we're on the traditional unceded territory of the Algonquin people. Uh, next up, I just wanted to uh, welcome um, all the members from IPAC, um, from PPX, as well as from the University of Ottawa Center on Governance. Um, we are used to seeing you in person, unfortunately, these days with the pandemic, um, we're, we're all virtual, but there's also a silver lining with the virtual, and that is that geography is no longer a barrier. And so we can welcome our public administration colleagues from across the country. Um, so anyone who's joining us from outside of the NCR, I want to say welcome and uh, and uh, bienvenue. Um, those of you who are regulars to our events will re recall that we actually had the same event last year, um, actually 2019, um, en français. And so um, it's the same topic um, of risk management. And we believe that's uh, as pertinent, if not more, um, during these un uncertain times um, with the pandemic. And so, pour mes amis uh, qui parlent français, uh, garde toujours au courant pour notre prochain événement en français. And uh, we uh, enjoyed doing uh, and hosting events in both official languages. Um, one thing at IPAC we've done over the past year or so is that with the pandemic, we've actually uh, recalibrated our programming to serve the needs of our members and our friends. And largely, it's a public uh, service um, audience, but uh, even academia and some, some members from the private sector as well. And so we've uh, delivered events um, with that thought in mind. So for example, we've, we've delivered events on mental health. Um, we've encouraged people to laugh um, with an event uh, this, uh, this past fall on the Yes Minister, the classic British uh, sitcom on, on governance, um, or some type of governance at least. Um, and more recently, we even held an event entitled uh, Wine and Wonks, so a mix of uh, policy and wine. And so we're really proud to join uh, PPX and the University of Ottawa Center on Governance to host this event again, um, and going back to really the basics um, of public administration, um, and particularly in, in areas of uh, planning and reporting, and that's risk management. So I hope you'll enjoy today's session, and uh, we look forward uh, to your feedback after the event, and we look forward to uh, you joining us for future events as well uh, by both uh, PPX um, IPAC as well as the Center on Governance. So thank you. Merci, Christine, back to you. Merci, Taran. Uh, C'est un plaisir de, de faire la présentation de, de notre animateur aujourd'hui. Nous avons Marc Morin et Olivier Chounanière. 
Donc, euh, je pourrais fournir quelques renseignements au sujet de, de Marc et Olivier. So, uh, Marc Morin is uh, formerly the Director General of Corporate Planning and Governments uh, within the Department of Innovation, Science and Economic Development. He was responsible for the strategic management functions in the department, including corporate planning, priority and risk management, parliamentary reporting and management tracking. So he has a long uh, history in this area. Also, he, he was the chief uh, risk officer uh, for the department and the senior designated official for project and program management. So brings lots of experience and I'm sure it'll be a wonderful presentation. Uh, Olivier was a partner and senior consultant at uh, Geller, uh, Jinga and Associates. He was also uh, an associate he currently is associate researcher at the Center of Governance at the University of Ottawa. Uh, previously, he was the director of performance, governance, and risk management through an interchange uh, assignment at uh, Innovation Science and Economic Development. And he also worked on several projects uh, in Canada and internationally, so he also brings a wealth of experience. Uh, so uh, they both uh, come with uh, um, interesting backgrounds and definitely contribute to this particular field, which seems to be having a bit of an, a reemergence. Donc, j'aimerais donner la parole à Marc et à um, uh, Olivier aussi. Merci. Merci, Christian. Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, Marc Morin here. I'm just going to take a quick two seconds to see if I can share my screen and I can bring us through the presentation uh, as well. Perfect. And so uh, thank you for joining me today. I think uh, happy to uh, kind of be back at, at this event. Uh, I think as Taran was saying, uh, we did it, I, I think, uh, almost over a year ago in French. It was well received. And so uh, happy to come back with the, uh, the, the new virtual edition uh, in English. And so, um, but, but feel free, of course, to um, uh, share your questions um, as, uh, as we go along. And, and me and Olivier, I think both will try to keep our presentation quite short. Um, today to, to cover off some of the main principles, but uh, really welcome uh, kind of that Q&A period where we find uh, that level of interaction really helps kind of uh, round out the uh, the presentation. So uh, quick disclaimer, I think um, I'm now the DG of HR at ISED, and so um, I, I, I'm speaking about my own personal experience and not of uh, ISED's uh, direct position, and Olivier is doing the same. Uh, I've had the benefit of doing strategic planning and risk management in, in three government departments, uh, probably specialized in it over eight or nine years, uh, as well as kind of um, been in, in program areas and, and being able to see kind of the uh, the strategic planning function more from a client perspective too. And so um, I, I'm happy to share kind of my experience from uh, both from a, a strategic planning practitioner perspective, but also uh, as I would call a, a, a victim of, of strategic planning and uh, the, uh, the information collection required. And so um, today's topic is really around risk management and, um, and, and, and the integration within strategic planning. I think there's a huge opportunity for the public service um, to um, look at uh, reintroducing uh, the notion of risk management. And, and so uh, for those of you that don't know or haven't been part of kind of this field for, um, I, I would say the last decade, you would note that from a risk management perspective, um, Treasury Board used to have a kind of a center of expertise on risk management. And I think it fell, it, it fell victim, or I'm assuming it fell victim to, to cuts and, and, and deficit reduction uh, initiatives and, and such that the, there is no kind of central guiding um, center of expertise on risk management for the federal public service right now. So a lot of departments are going um, and, and, in, and, and doing their own thing in this space, which, um, which is good and bad, because I think it's leading to some, some, some interesting innovation, um, but also creating some gaps in terms of uh, some departments taking um, some approaches and, and, and maybe others uh, just, just leaving it to its wayside. And so um, I'm going to start with um, just, just a very quick a kind of synopsis of, of, of kind of the strategic planning function. I suspect that uh, a lot of participants here today are, are, are perhaps from uh, the Canadian Federal Public Service, perhaps even working in strategic planning or, or risk management functions. But I also know that there are others that, 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 are, that they're joining us from outside. And so I'm just going to take a quick 30 seconds just, just to situate strategic planning for you in that um, uh, just about every government department has a strategic planning function. Um, you, you'll see its placement within the department uh, quite variable. I, I would suggest that um, many departments have this strategic planning function uh, housed within kind of a strategic policy 
uh, branch where um, their colleagues that are working on kind of budget letters and strategic uh, strategic policy aspects in terms of that that overarching outward vision are, 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 are teamed up with strategic planning folks who, who kind of um, uh, I, I, I would say kind of take care of the strategic management of, of the of the organization and and likely have more of an internal focus in terms of kind of how do we how do we operate within. Um, a lot of those functions take on um, varying degrees of other functions as well. Some have pro project management, some don't. Some have investment planning, some don't. Some have uh, a, 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 just a mixed bag in terms of kind of how they're organized. But that being said, pretty much all strategic planning shops, uh, their, their core function is um, going out to all aspects of the department, collecting information, and that level of information differs, um, but but undoubtedly it, it talks about plans um, uh, and, and and results. And so um, they go out to the various sectors within the organization uh, or branches, pull the information together, put it together in a nice cohesive story, and and send it to where it needs to be. And so where, where I'm talking about, and it says the development of risk management, but it's but it's also it's also strategic planning um, at, at a very kind of uh, immature state, it could be limited to, you know, just your traditional compliance, your traditional reporting in terms of the department needs to publish a departmental plan. Okay, we'll go collect the information, bring it together, take care of that. And so um, the, um, at, at that very kind of limited scope, I, I would suggest its value proposition is, how do I get the product, the nicest product out the door with minimizing the lift or the ask on the sectors, recognizing that they're all working on their own thing. So how do I go and surgically get the information I need, pull it out um, in, in, in the least painful way and publish a really great report demonstrating kind of our plans or, or what we've done or um, how, we've, how we've met some sort of regulatory compliance such as the management accountability framework or so on and so on. I would argue just given that function, there's a tremendous opportunity to go beyond kind of that, that traditional kind of compliance and reporting function and actually drive value for the organization. Given that we're already going out, we already have the tools to go out to all the sectors and ask for things. Um, if we can change the type of information that we're asking and, and getting that type of collection, bringing it together, we can also drive change and value within the organization in terms of who gets the money, who needs to have the money and where's not, where are there some pressures, where are the highest risks, um, who needs kind of a little bit more attention uh, of senior management um, that, that maybe they're not getting, which, which, is, which, is, which, which is causing um, some frustration or, or, or exposing the organization to either not achieving its results or risks. And so um, the strategic planning function has this tremendous opportunity and some departments have taken advantage of this. Others I would say are trying uh, and some just, uh, I think are just limiting themselves to uh, traditional compliance and reporting. And so um, that, that's kind of the, 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 the overarching um, landscape. In terms of risk, um, risk is a very charged word. It means a lot of things to a lot of different people. Uh, you talk risk to actuaries or, or folks in the insurance industry, they have a very, very um, precise focus in terms of what, what is risk, how to measure it, and how to translate that into, in, into business processes or business decisions, and so, uh, which is very, very valid. And so um, to me, there's, there, there, there's various buckets of types of risks that an organization can manage. And depending on um, the nature of how you wanna utilize the, the concept of risk, I would suggest it probably changes um, depending on kind of that, 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 that focus. And so when we're talking about um, individual G's and C's or even, even the, the insurance industry, it's very precise in terms of, uh, in terms of, in terms of risk. You talk to project management professionals, it's, it's, it's part of the PM Bach. Um, you, you, you need to look at kind of what are your risks to your project. That is a very different level of risk than when we're talking about maybe something like the insurance industry. Then we talk about programs. And so programs, um, individual programs, when you get set up, you have, you have your slew of outcomes that you want to achieve. You have your indicators. And then you're looking at it from a different lens in terms of risk to my program and in terms of the achieving of its objectives. 
um, there, there are there are sector level risks, and 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 um, when, when I look at sector, uh, we call them sectors that I said, but it's, it could be your branches or your divisions or how, whatever your nomenclature is. Um, you, you're looking at how am I operating as 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 a unit, and you, you'll you'll typically see and 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 a lot of risks around. Oh, I don't have enough money to to do X Y Z. Um, I, I I don't believe that's the. the I don't know those resource considerations should be should be considered in the concept in the context of risk, but that's that's a conversation for for another day. Um, there's a lot of risks around corporate, and and and, and you'll find and, and and it's it's a challenge because you have to disentangle that too because every time you go talk to uh, sectors or programs, they're oh, it's, I got my HR risks, I got my IT risks, I got my this risk. It's like okay, that's great, great intel, thank you. What are your risks for your business? Um, because that's, I think, um, a, a whole other aspect that you're able to glean and bring forward. And I think when we talk about strategic planning and how I'd like to position it um, for uh, Olivier's, uh, Olivier's piece, but also kind of how I want to circle back and talk about the vision is really around this enterprise level. And that enterprise level needs to be able to have an extraction tool that is based on understanding the corporate level risks, understanding the sector level risks, understanding the program level risks, and bringing it to a level where we're looking at kind of our departmental results framework and what's going to impact the organization in terms of doing that. So I think that's, that's a very important concept because I think some folks get lost when we talk about risk because they're focused too much on on individual kind of um, maybe transactional risk or they're stuck on program risk. My experience is, is folks get really concentrated on the corporate risks in terms of in terms of that to the detriment of, of maybe um, kind of this enterprise level. So it's, it's about maintaining that um, that that level of focus on, on the enterprise level. And so this will be the last slide. Um, that I speak to, I'll, I'll take a break um, and I'll, I'll, I'll turn it to Olivier, but the, the, the whole notion of integrated risk management, and, and, and that's what I was talking about when we're looking across all the different levels um, and, and looking at um, uh, breaking down silos. And so it's not looking about one sector, it's about looking at all the sectors. And what are our tools, A, to collect information, like I was talking about from a strategic planning perspective, but also kind of to bring forth a culture change of around risk uh, and around risk identification and what it means. Because I think in the context of, in, uh, of the public service, you're going to get, especially with senior management, um, that, that may not be kind of as um, uh, attuned to kind of the whole purpose around risk, is, is that there is a certain level of anxiety. Some of it's very much founded in terms of the public service as we outline our risks, uh, especially considering access to information and and you know what if if, if if as we go through risk identification you know you, you start thinking about okay is this if this falls into the hands of the globe and mail it's going to look like we're, we're really not managing this place when in fact we are and so um there, there's those considerations uh to, to to take place but it's also kind of a culture change and i'll come back to that in in, in a bit but um ultimately um risk management um, is, is, is about using risk intelligence to inform um, decision-making and business practice. And, and if I could underline that, I'd go back and I'd underline it. I'd put it in bold. I'd put it in shining lights um, because I, I, I think I've, I've seen this process time and time again, uh, whether it comes to setting priorities or identifying risks, um, that it makes its way into a corporate risk profile. It makes its way into a nice uh, corporate plan. Uh, these are our priorities but nothing actually changes. And so on the client side, um, I've actually, my, my, my unit, um, not because of me, but just, just the function, of course, uh, was highlighted as the biggest risk in, in the department. And I was like, okay, well, well, what happens now, right? And it's like, do I get more money? Well, no, okay. Uh, do, do, do I have to go to governance more often? No, um, okay. Nothing actually happened. And the same thing happens when, when, when one of my areas was identified as a priority. Um, we need to make it, mean something so that all of this work actually uh, adds value. And so um, I, to me, the, the, the large part of the process that we're trying to do here is identify our desired outcomes, our business strategies. Let's have a conversation about risk um, and, and let's bring it to kind of a consistent level around what 
what are we talking about when we're talking about risk? And ultimately, it needs to feed our, our priority setting exercise. And if it doesn't, there, there, there's a big gap there and you're going to lose people. You're, you're going to lose people. People are like, oh, risk doesn't matter. Like we're going to spend all this work kind of, I don't know, whether we're doing voting or risk identification or whatever. And if it doesn't translate into real change and it doesn't align to program planning changes or resource changes, why did we do all this work? And it's just another feeding the beast exercise. So we need to get away from there. So perhaps there, this is a good transition point. I'll turn it to Olivier. Olivier uh, is going to talk to you a bit about kind of what we've done um, at, at ISED to kind of push the culture, to push the, um, um, the practice of risk management integrated in, into strategic planning uh, around what we've done. And I'll come back and I'll talk to you about kind of the, the vision setting exercise, and then we can open it up to Q&A. So maybe I'll stop there and uh, I'll ask Olivier to, uh, to take the camera. Yes, perfect. Thank you, Mark. Um, I hope everyone can hear me well. Good, Mark. You're yeah. the only one. Who... I hear you. <laughs> I can hear you only. <laughs> So yeah, so my, uh, basically my section of the presentation is focusing on the work achieved between 2018 and maybe mid 2020, when I left my position of the Director of Performance Governance and Risk Management to go back to my private practice. So a few disclaimers to start with. So since I'm no longer an I said employee, um, basically, the views and, op and opinion that I will express are mine and do not necessarily reflect ICED's official position. Also, uh, it's the first time I'm doing this. So uh, giving a presentation uh, in, by looking at the black screen. So I will ask for your indulgence. And also, it's always a challenge presenting after Marc Morin. So I'll try to do my best. I'll take the opportunity also to uh, acknowledge the work of my former team, uh, who basically worked really hard to revamp the risk management practice to make it uh, more meaningful. Um, I'm sure some of them are on this webinar today, so I would like to thank them. Uh, I have the privilege today to present you the work that we have done, but there was a team behind this and they were not afraid of challenging assumptions and bring forward new ideas. So again, I don't want to repeat what Mark just said, but why revamping the uh, risk management approach, frameworks, uh, its methods and tools? Uh, there were two main triggers, uh, basically. The first one was an internal audit uh, conducted in 2017-18 that basically highlighted different issues gap uh, with the previous way of proceeding, the previous uh, risk management approach. But also, so it gives us a lot of legitimacy uh, for us to make some uh, cultural and methodological changes. Uh, but also, and this is very important, and I think the timing was what we're talking about opportunities uh, later on. Uh, it was the vision and the corporate priorities of the ADM CFO who really wanted to boost the strategic management capabilities of uh, his sector and by extension, the department. And in terms of risk management, uh, I think uh, he wanted us to shift the focus from basically assessing uh, risk from existing plan and strategies to be part of the decision-making and strategy setting processes. So a little bit like Mark said to be more relevant to be upfront and to be meaningful uh, for decision makers and people who are uh, basically investing time uh, in this process. And, and also I would add a third uh, reason. So it's always good to always continuously improve and strengthen in maturing your practice in any type of organization. So why are we doing this? Uh, again, beside the traditional role of basically uh, look at uncertainties, what could go wrong uh, that would impede us from achieving uh, the departmental or the sectoral results. I think it's to help, uh, again, the decision-making, the planning uh, and the strategy setting process in an informed way. Again, how can we help developing new strategies and not just assess current ones, also uh, improve organizational agility uh, by um, this 
display of allocating and reallocating resources uh, where high risk and pressure are felt. Set achievable ex performance expectations. So you saw in Mark's slide that we first define outcomes, results, and then we look at the risks. Um, it's possible, and I'll show you with a concrete example, that risk information can be key to questions, uh, to question the, ri the, the, the results, sorry, that we have and the targets and see if we cannot um, reassess and redefine them uh, based on the information uh, that we gathered. And also, and that was a priority of the department's support of culture of innovation and expectations. By seizing opportunities, risk is not just about what could go wrong, but seizing opportunities and take intelligent risks. So how did we do that? So basically we revamped the whole framework, uh, but basically also we uh, brought a new culture, a new philosophy in terms of strategic management and risk management was a big part of that. So the framework was comprised of three main components. The first one, the traditional one, uh, the resources. Uh, basically, we wanted to provide tools, advice, guidance, information to our, to employees, but every employee of the department, because we really think that uh, risk management is a shared responsibility and not just sole uh, responsibility of risk practitioners. The second component is the governance one. So if we really want to influence decision-making and strategy setting processes and basically help uh, enhance effectiveness of the department, how do we do that in terms of governance? Uh, so our strategy was threefold. First, we drafted uh, a policy that outlined uh, key roles and responsibilities, requirements, accountabilities, and we basically asked the DM to approve and sign it for moral legitimacy. One of the complement of the policy was the creation of the chief risk officer. So I just said that risk management was the responsibility of everyone, but we thought in 2018, 2019, that it was important to have someone who was responsible uh, of basically uh, supporting the integration of risk information um, into the uh, departmental, sectoral program, planning and decision-making. The third component and subcomponent, sorry, uh, was the uh, committees. So we were asking ourselves the question, do we create a specific committee for risk management or do we integrate the current ones? Um, after tense discussions, we decided to go with the second option. Um, because what is important, it's making sure that risk information is an ongoing focus uh, on those senior management committees. So by creating our own committee, maybe we were taking the risk, not having the right people sitting at the table. While existing committees, we, were, we, we wanted to make sure that we were, again, sharing information uh, through a process with key decision makers. The third component, which we called intelligence, it's we really thought this is where we could make a significant impact. So it was basically um, looking at other areas of expertise to see how they can help us, again, making the risk management practice more meaningful, uh, providing information in a timely manner, uh, because as everyone knows, the uh, the internal, external factors, threats, risks, they always change. And we need to keep abreast of these changes in a timely manner. And this is where business intelligence and strategic foresight, uh, they could play a big role. So getting information in a timely manner uh, and also uh, providing information uh, to, for example, the different dashboards, uh, the departmental dashboard, the sectoral dashboard. So to have a specific uh, place for risk management where we could share information. And in terms of strategic foresight, this is something that we were starting to build. So again, I don't know where it is actually, but we were looking at what's out there, uh, sometimes free in terms of information. And I would like to point out today one very useful tool that it's free. Uh, you can go on the website or download the app. It's called the Strategic IQ for from the forum. So we really used it uh, in terms of 
providing the uh, department uh, insights and contextual, uh, contextual intelligence. Uh, in terms of lesson learned, so I think those three components work well for the two years that we we're developing them. But if I would go back in 2008, I think, I think and again, this is where I'm expressing my personal opinion here, I think we missed the fourth um, component, which would be change management, because risk, it's all about change. When you're uh, developing mitigation strategies, you're actually providing alternative scenarios to the department, to the sectors, to the program. So again, if you decide to go with those alternative scenarios, uh, you need to, uh, to uh, implement change quickly. But also from a risk management practice perspective, since we were bringing a new culture, a new way of doing risk management, we needed those risks, change management tools and approach another for everyone in the organization to first be aware of those changes, to understand them and actually buy into those changes and implement them in their, uh, in their uh, daily routine and their business, what they were doing. So uh, Mark, next slides, please. Sorry, thank you. So um, in a nutshell, the different components of this framework. So we talked about three main components earlier on, and this is where we wanted also to develop tools for specific audiences. So the first one, uh, the um, for every employee of the department. So we developed a guide that basically helped us to lay out and come communicate the new methodology and process. The guide was designed for every employee, so it favors simplicity and practicality over theoretical concepts. We also developed a one-hour risk management 101 session for everyone who was interested with a nice two-pager uh, placemat, uh, very colorful, that was providing basic information about risk management. At the sector level, so there was there's a dozen sector uh, at ISAD, um, so when we were assessing the risk management approach, we noticed that uh, basically every sector was using its own approach and uh, generally built on similar theoretical foundations. Uh, they greatly varied in their implementation and also in their timelines. So, so basically uh, like uh, various processes and ways of uh, managing risks, and we needed to harmonize this. Um, we also provided a uh, self-assessment maturity model, so sectors were able to assess their current capabilities in terms of risk management, but also provide a course of action for continuous improvement. Uh, we developed an in-house community of practice, which we later expanded to the uh, ISED portfolio organizations, such as Stats Canada, NRC, the regional development agencies, space agency, in order to share best practices, lesson learns with the, I would say, medium term objective, even long term objective to implement a common approach across the portfolio. Then at the corporate level, uh, we basically developed uh, and get approved the uh, policy that I just talked about, the chief risk officer position, the traditional corporate risk profile that was basically providing insight to the key enterprise risk and proposal responses on an annual basis. But the risk register was more a tool to monitor those risks on an ongoing basis and feeding the different dashboards uh, in terms of information. Uh, so it could be less static than a corporate risk profile. Uh, next slide, please. So Mark just presented you uh, the different uh, levels of risk management in the department. So in order to have an enterprise wide view of risk, we needed to uh, select a specific approach in order to gather those risks, assess those risks. So we decided to go with the sectors first. So basically we engage with the dozen sectors, key reps from those sectors over, I don't know, maybe 25, 30 facilitated sessions in order again to identify and assess sectoral risk and share them with the sector senior management 
and asking them which one should be brought to the enterprise attention. Then there was an escalation process of all those risks, making sure that line uh, with the uh, program sector and departmental results and um, ask the departmental senior management to review those risks in order to determine what needed to be included at the departmental level, which led to the development of the enterprise risk landscape. So basically, did we succeed uh, at what we were trying to achieve, i.e. making sure that risk information was part of the decision-making and the strategy setting process? Uh, I would like to think so. Um, I think there was an increased inter uh, integration of risk information into the decision-making process. For example, risk became uh, one of the key drivers in the 2021 priorities and also an input for the resource allocation, reallocation discussions. Also, uh, it, it was very helpful for us to increase emphasis of risk information in various activities, uh, such as performance uh, information profiles, so where you find the key information about the program, the results that they're trying to achieve, TB submissions, management control frameworks, et cetera, et cetera. And I will end up with this. Um, these sessions also add, I would say, unintended uh, consequences, where basically the information we gathered help us understand better the departmental results framework and assess it and see that maybe some, some results in the DRF, uh, which we call it, uh, were maybe either ill-defined or maybe not fully aligned with the programs, at least the key programs we're trying to achieve. So risk information become one of the inputs for a review of the DRF, which led uh, to a whole revamp of the departmental results. And I think I was gone by then, but I think uh, in the last months or weeks, the new departmental result framework um, got approved by both ICED senior management and TBS. So again, risk information was there to help us not only to mitigate uh, risk, but also to give us information, making sure that we had the right set of results. So that was in a nutshell what we did in the last two years. So uh, over to you, Mark. That's perfect. Thanks, thanks, Olivier. Uh, yeah, it was it was quite uh, qu quite the ride over the over the course of the two years as we, as we built um, as we built uh, that up. So I'll, I'll, I have two other slides to present. I'll, I'll, I'll be quick. I think um, and I think in response to one of the questions, happy to share the presentation afterwards uh, so, so that you can read it. I'm not going to spend a lot of time speaking to the benefits of risk management. Um, Olivier spoke to it. You, you've got some information here, and uh, by virtue of the fact that you signed up for this, you probably <laughs> you, you're, you're probably convinced. Where I do want to spend um, maybe just a, a quick few minutes is is on this uh, enterprise management framework uh, presentation that that we put forward, and 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 so this kind of positions risk management and and kind of how we. Um, how we kind of want to govern the organization from a strategic management perspective and that um, you'll see on, on the left side um, for uh, folks in within the, the, the federal public service, um, uh, hopefully you're familiar with the department, uh, uh, the, the policy on results. And so the po policy on results mandates that all federal government departments build um, kind of an inventory of your programs. And you'll see that on the, the left hand side, the blue box. And uh, at the enterprise level, it's it, it's at the the, the 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 top tranche of boxes. Um, and then within that, they they've also asked us to to create a departmental results framework, and so that um, that that we outline the results of those programmings. And so you you'll see below, we we would we would perhaps have portfolios of programs or individual programs, each one of which needs to create their own outcomes. And um, I would say I would suggest even even the light purple boxes, although not mandated mandated to do. I, I know each department is trying to figure out kind of a way to, to to define their management agenda and the outcomes for which they want to achieve. I would suggest that enterprise risk management is needs to be inserted there. I think that the the Treasury Board policy on results stops there in terms of identify your programs, identify your outcomes. I think um, this is a huge space for, for enterprise risk management to play in terms of you've identified your outcomes, the things you want to achieve. Now is the basis to have your conversation around what are the risks 
um, that uh, are present that will stop me in the achievement of my outcomes. And uh, that could go both on the internal management side, but also on the program side. From there, understanding your, your level of risk, your risk exposure, that should be the ultimate kind of um, the push to do uh, departmental priorities. And so I've been to, in, in, involved in a lot of government departments. They manage the two separately if they manage both at all uh, in terms of uh, everybody sets departmental priorities, but whether it's informed by risk or not. And to me, that's the good litmus test in terms of saying, well, look, if, 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 if you've set these as your priorities, but you think these are your risks, this doesn't compute. And we did one of the two exercises wrong. And so um, that was the, that was continuously the conversation. And, and the fact that we've linked the two now, I think are start culturally are starting to make people's um, uh, light bulbs in, 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 in head, at people's heads go off in terms of saying, oh, OK, I, I get the linkage and it's starting to make a lot more sense. And so so that's that's a very important factor. And then on the red side, we, we've got another policy um, more so around the, the management of um, I was I was mess up the name, but 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 investments and projects. And so um, a, a new series it's a new a policy suite with some directives that outline how departments are supposed to be making investments, how they're supposed to be um, governing um, the, the management of whether it's projects, experiments, contracts, G's and C's, change initiatives, you name it. And I, I would suggest that most departments do the, 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 red, the red piece, whether it's good or bad, but they do it um, in terms of the management of investments. And, and some departments have little pots of money that you know they, they look at each year and say, okay, well, this year we're going to spend it here, here, here. Some departments just do a reallocation exercise in terms of saying, okay, we're going to scoop X amount from everybody. And then these are the priorities that we're going to put. Um, and then we have these investment management decisions. Wh wh what I would suggest is the biggest um, leap is between the blue boxes and the red boxes. And it, without that connection, you're going to lose people on the blue boxes because it doesn't matter. Um, and, 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 and I'm sorry, but, 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 but the way that the world works, um, generally speaking, but the way, the way organizations work as well, is if you're going to set priorities, and you're going to talk about risks. If there's no linkage to the so what, if, if that means we are not going to be investing more management, time, effort, energy, resources in those things, they're not really the priority. And so it's all nice and well to sit in a nice report and say, these are the top three priorities. But if nobody sees any action uh, as a result of this, and the, the red boxes are not linked with the blue boxes, you're just going to be wasting people's time. And, and, and then people are not going to pay an interest into your DRF. They're not going to pay interest into your program inventory. Uh, I would suggest most departments that I've been in, whether it was um, the new program inventory or the previous PAA, I would suggest that most employees didn't even understand or, or know what those things were because we weren't using them. And once you start using them as a strategic management tool, once you start allocating resources based on this exercise, everybody starts to get involved. And that's how we got uh, um, people involved in the risk management exercise in terms of saying like, look, if you identify your risks and you work with us, this is going to lead into priority setting, which will lead to money. And everybody came to the table because we started talking about money and we started talking about addressing pressures and, and bringing a, a systematic way to making resource decisions. And we used resources, the dollars, to kind of as, as a mechanism to bring people to the table. Now, it didn't always translate into dollars. It could have resulted in terms of, okay, well, now I get more face time with deputy on this specific issue because it is one of the highest risks. Or it gave insight in saying, oh, wow, those other areas have bigger risk than I do. I should stop complaining and stop asking for money because these guys are on fire and I, I can manage, right? And so, so that's, that's the nature of kind of what we're trying to set up. And so did we get here? No. Are we getting there? I think so. And um, one of the tactics that we used, and I'm not saying it's the best tactic, I'm saying it's the tactic that we used, was um, to initially start this because folks were very familiar with priority setting. Um, we, we conducted kind of the priority setting and then we backwards engineered the risks as a first step in year one in terms of saying, well, look, you set these priorities. So that kind of means that you think that these are your risks and these how, this is how the two concepts should link together. And then once they saw that, they're like, yeah, that makes good sense. And now the hope is now that we can start doing that, now we can start front ending 
the, the risk conversation to lead to priorities now that they understand the linkage. And I think that that evolution and that change management as Olivier was talking and, and the culture change, um, you can't underestimate it because uh, everybody has a different level of understanding of risks. Nobody necessarily agrees that this is the inter enterprise management framework, or at least philosophically. And so to get them there, I think is very important. So I'm going to stop there. I think we have we have a lot of questions. And so um, maybe I'll, I'll stop there. I, I, uh, and I think Christine, or maybe it's Eric who, who's moderating the question. So I'll just stop. Great, merci, Mark. So um, I'd like to introduce uh, Eric Champagne, who's an associate professor of public administration at the University of Ottawa on the board of PPX and involved with IPAC, uh, who will be moderating the question and answers. I see there's lots there and people have been participating. So uh, j'aimerais donner la parole à Eric. Merci, Christine. Thank you. Uh, we have a lot of questions indeed. This is great. And um, I'll start by answering some answering some of them that are more uh, practical, if you will. Uh, some have asked for the presentation, some have asked for the recording of this uh, um, uh, um, webinar, and indeed uh, we will provide uh, recordings of this uh, webinar on our respective uh, website, uh, PPX, uh, IPAC NCR, and certainly the Center on Governance will provide link on our websites and also the presentation will be also available. So that answer a few uh, of the first questions that were uh, asked. Um, now there's uh, Bruce uh, Mannion who's um, asking, reallocating resources to align with evolving priorities, risk and performance has long been uh, the holy grail of uh, resource planners and the public sector, like the grail itself, the actual accomplishment of this alignment of resources has long been more myth than reality. How have you actually realigned resources in light of your revised approach to RM, risk management? Matt, that, that, you... that, 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 that's a great question, Bruce. And, and, and I think that you're, you're right. It, it is the holy grail because I think once we have started aligning resources based on this, the process becomes real. People become involved. And it's a bit about what I was talking about um, just, just as I ended in terms of perhaps reverse engineering it to start. And just showing, okay, I, I know deputy, you're gonna make the decision to allocate here, here, and here. And then maybe re reverse engineering it and saying, okay, well, 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 by doing so, what you're telling me is that your priorities are here and that your risks are now here. And then kind of introducing the notion of them being tied together. Uh, did we get there? No, like we don't have the holy grail in hand. We're, we're still searching it, uh, searching for it but I believe we're getting closer. And I believe um, from a cultural perspective, our resource management folks, um, now that we've brought forward with risk, they, the, uh, like light bulbs came off on our, uh, on our last presentation where they said, Mark, we can't have this conversation once a year. We need you to come back every quarter so that we can start having a better understanding of our risk. And I wanna align how that's, and so, they need to want it. You you can't you can't force it on them. And so I think you you show them the linkages based on the decisions that they would have made at, at anyways, because at the at the end of the day they are doing risk management. Let's be clear, they are. It's just not systematic, and it's just not evident. And so what we want to do is give them more risk information and showing them how how that's being done. Will it work? Fingers crossed. Uh, and if, and if somebody does get to the holy grail, uh, I'm not. I'm not aware of it and, and would be happy to learn from uh, from their tactics as well. But this, this, is, this is our approach that we used. Thank you, Mark. Um, I'm picking up a few questions here and there because uh, we have some time constraints. So I'm just going to uh, select some of them, uh, not necessarily randomly, but uh, to avoid to repeat our, ourselves. There's Shazma Haji who is uh, asking a very interesting question from an operational point of view, I would say. Uh, how would you advise a team to start? Top down, bottom up, approaches welcome. Go for it, Olivier. That's a very interesting question. I think from an ISAT perspective, we were fortunate enough, like I said, to have uh, the audit, the internal audit giving us a lot of legitimacy, but also the full support of our ADM CFO, who basically lay out the ground for us to make those changes. So in our specific case, I think we had these opportunities. Uh, but again, um, for us pushing this as an agenda, 
would have been more difficult uh, than having these circumstances. Uh, but like I say, sometimes you have also a committee of practice uh, that could influence uh, changes. Um, and, and sometimes a good old crisis can also help uh implementing these changes but in our case yes it was more top down than a bottom up approach mark anything you would like to add no i, I think you're right like i i think it it, it needs to it needs to go in a, a a bit of both i think um uh getting senior management leadership at least in charge of the function kind of being kind of a, a supporter behind this and, and somebody who's really to, willing to push the system is is ultimately kind of the the, 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 the key portion. And so um, I, I if I were to start from scratch, I would make sure that um, my DG, my ADM uh, are on board for pushing this because it is gonna take a while. And I think it's important to manage expectations. And if you think you're gonna get there in a year, you're not. Uh, to, me, it's, it, to me, it's about taking the long game on it and making incremental progress, both with the sectors and and with um, uh, and with senior management. But ha had I had we restarted this and, and started from scratch, I, I would I would choose a sector or two that is ambitious, build a coalition of the willing, and and get them to do some showcasing, and then concentrate on the top. Thank you. Um... Um, Olivier, there was a well. There was a lot of interest for uh, frameworks and uh, free tools, and you mentioned one of them. Uh, I'm not sure I remember the name, but uh, people would be very interested to know where to access this uh, free tool you mentioned. And if so, is is there any way you can put it in right uh, live on the uh, the chat room uh, so people can uh, can access it if it's possible, but maybe not. Olivier? No, absolutely. I, I think someone uh, already shared the link and thank you so much, uh, Monsieur Rabin, for this. Uh, I can reshare it. Uh, so it's the Strategic IQ by the World Economic Forum. I just pointed out to Wantel, there's several. Uh, some of them are free, uh, so they're very useful. But this one uh, was the one we used. Uh, there's a specific component uh, for Canada, and the information is provided by McGill University. So as part of or uh, different activities to develop uh, or revamp the risk management practice, uh, we consulted with risk management experts within the federal government, other departments, for example, but outside. And so basically, we went to Montreal to meet uh people at mcgill who were providing information with regards to canada to the world economic forum just to understand the process how they collect this information but again you have information on several topics that could help you again to uh get information for your environmental scan okay perfect can can you just um, recopy it i guess it's the intelligence weforum.org, but just copy it so it's, it seems that uh, we got the right um, reference. Now, we still have maybe uh, three minutes um, uh, to, for the, the Q&A session, so I would ask you to really answer, uh, really by short answer, because we, uh, we're we going to try to cover some of them. There's Brent Manuel here. He will be entering the public service in March or April. Uh, will his department or branch have a risk management framework available to him? Is it like something like a, a, a normal practice? And what kind of risk management framework will be available to him? Um, to, to, to be honest, I'm, and, and I can't speak for the public service, but I, I would be surprised if depending on depending on your department, I think um, this this used to be a core a core function, like I was saying, treasure board, um, I, I think for, for for a variety of reasons that has let go and, and that has led downstream effects on departments to to to, to perhaps let go. Um, however, that being said, in operational types of uh, organizations, I, I, I know that uh, transport has an interesting one from an operational side, food inspection agency, I think CBSA is doing some progress in, in, in that area, um, that it, it's hit or miss. 
there was a question, very interesting question from Alexander Tanner that can take us a little bit aside of your uh, core uh, arguments here. But how does emergency response, resilience uh, building, mitigation fit into the risk management framework? And I think it's very interesting in the context of the current pandemic. Uh, how do you, what's your take on this, uh, Olivier Omar? Omar? So um, I, I think two things, um, probably a lot more things, but two things jump to mind. I, I guess one is one is around that risk foresight function. And so uh, to me, I think it's a very under-resourced function across the public service um, in, in that um, we, we are purposefully spending resources to look at the outside risk environment to kind of um, adjust to, 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 those, to, to those components. And I think based on kind of the, the, the levels of risk that I was showing before, I, I'd be curious to see kind of where that, where that falls within, because I think depending on the type of, of threat, and so if we're talking COVID for, for this instance, you know, I, I, would, I, I would be very hopeful that it would fall within the risk foresight function or, or an identified risk, uh, merging risk. Uh, especially for organizations like uh, Public Health Agency of Canada, Health Canada, and then that 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 could translate into other things. That it just the, 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 that those linkages don't exist, and so it, it is, I think, a, a weakness uh, that, that 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 is inherent with our system in that we don't have these risk management functions across the the entire public service. They're not linked in at this point, and um, it's it's it, it it falls victim to being kind of unstructured. Um, and, and hopeful that we're able to manage these risks in a very unstructured way, which, um, as we know, isn't always the case. All right, for the sake of time, one last question from coming from uh, Jackson Reggie, uh, who's talking about routine. It's true that in the past, it was more like an ad hoc kind of approach to uh, risk management. He's talking about routine and what kind, how do you and integrate these processes and these systems in the routine of the government, the tool, the processes, and the governance. Uh, and do you believe uh, uh, it should be uh, pu pursued this way, like to, to be more integrated to the uh, current uh, routine of uh, government uh, management uh, making? I'll turn to Olivia, but super quickly, I think, um, yes, I, I think it needs to be integrated. I think, um, I, and again, take, take, take a long-term vision. Don't, don't expect to just do this once and everybody's bought it. What, what you need to do is continuously build. And what you'll find is that first lift is big because you've got to do your risk identification. Once you get to risk validation, it becomes a lot easier because now you get the products and you're like, oh, these are about right. But what about this thing? We're missing it. And then you bring it up. And so to me, it's about that routine. And if you keep at it, it's not as big as a heavy lift. Thank you. Olivier, did you have uh, something else to add? Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure I will specifically answer to this question. But again, risk management is part of strategic management. It's one component. We could have talked about uh, performance measurement, BI, et cetera, et cetera. So it's one component. And, and we need to focus on the integration of these areas of expertise. Um, also, when I was mentioning previously the governance structures, uh, this is also another reason why we decided not to create a specific governance committee on risk management, but integrate other committees, uh, for example, the uh, departmental, I, I'm sorry, I, I have the acronym in my head, but the uh, the IT and architectural uh, committee, governance committee. So again, learning more about these uh, IT projects, uh, issues, challenge they're facing, the objective that they're trying to achieve, and always have risk management part of this discussion. So I talk about IT, could be same thing with the data strategy of the department. So to be part in several discussions. Uh, and so risk, performance, and strategic management as a whole is always part of these discussions, and not just the responsibility of a little shop located on the second floor, for example, but being everyone's responsibility. Lovely. Uh, Christine, with your permission, I'm, and for the sake of time, I'm just going to uh, uh, just going to make a few remarks for the end, and I'll, I'll give you the 
uh, the floor for the uh, the last word. Um, now I want to share with you uh, just a little uh, uh, information uh, before I will leave you, uh, and I want to make sure that I thank you all the participants, obviously. Uh, for being here today to this webinar uh, jointly organized by uh, PPX, uh, IPAC, and the Center on Governance at the University of Ottawa. At some point, we were 300 participants, and there was uh, 460 registrants to this webinar, so it shows the need and the, the interest for the topic. I'd like to thank also Marc, Olivier, thank you so much for the interesting and insightful uh, presentation. Uh, uh, we, we hoped all the participants enjoyed the presentation as much uh, as I did. And I want to thank our partners, uh, PPX, uh, IPAC, and the Center on Governance. I just want to encourage you to stay tuned. We have a lot of uh, uh, upcoming activities um, at PPX. We have always a free membership. If you want to stay tuned, you can just uh, enter your information. We have upcoming webinars, a discussion event uh, on COVID evaluation performance measurement and what comes next at, uh, with the organized jointly with the Canadian Evaluation Society. The session one will be on lesson from, pandem from the pandemic on March 4, uh, same time, 12 to, to 1. Session two, going into the future, Wednesday, March 17 at 12. And of course, we have our annual symposium on adaptation, planning and performance through gout and beyond COVID on Wednesday, May 26. And I would like to thank IPAC and CR, obviously a great partner of, um, of IPAC, uh, of, of PPX and, and the Center on Governance as well. And I want to feature here the annual conference that is coming to Ottawa Gats, now hopefully um, uh, fully uh, in person, but uh, if it's not at least uh, partly in person or uh, virtual, who knows? But that's uh, the information is here in this uh, slide. So uh, if you can take notes of the website and you will find all the information, the topic will be shaping future of public service position to strengthen Canada's recovery. Um, and uh, we'll, uh, I welcome everybody to to, to have a look. And at the Center on Governance, we have launched, uh, we're launching right now our professional development program. And we, uh, with Olivier Choignard, actually, and I, using actually some of our research on uh, uh, emergency preparedness and, and other topics uh, related to management, we have a course on governance and risk management in the public sector that is upcoming. Uh, you'll find the information on our websites. Uh, and also, uh, this first version of the course will be in French. So it's gouvernance et gestion du risque dans le secteur public. So it covers the, um, the, the, the topics I wanted to share with you and the upcoming event. Back to you, Christine, for the last word. Thank you. Oh, merci, Eric. Donc, j'aimerais remercier uh, les présenteurs et uh, Eric aussi et Terrain uh, pour la, uh, la session aujourd'hui. C'était très intéressant et uh, les participants ont, ont soulevé les questions, les enjeux très, très relevants uh, au, au sujet du risque. So, I, I want to take an opportunity to thank our presenters who did an excellent job today, uh, Eric and uh, Terrain as well, for their updates and also you, the participants to this session, for raising such great questions that really stimulated our thinking about this important area and uh, increasingly so in the context that we're living today. So thank you again and have a great afternoon. Merci et bonne journée.